Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on COVID-19 and the social impacts of rural communities. My name is Philip Loring. I'm the Errol Chair in Food Policy and Society at the University of Guelph. And I'm joined today by a number of really fantastic panelists that I'm going to introduce just now. First, there's Abdul Rahim Abdullahi. He's an Errol Scholar and PhD candidate in the Department of Geography. Next, we have Dr. Ryan Gibson, who's an associate professor and the Libro Professor in Regional Economic Development. He's in the Rural Planning and Development Program at the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development. We're also joined by Dr. Helen Hambly Odame. She's an associate professor of capacity in the Capacity Development and Extension Program, also in the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development. And finally, Jackie Empson Laporte. She's an environmental specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Now, to get us started, I know we're all watching or participating in this from different parts in our homes and different parts of the world, but I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides in the ancestral and treaty lands of several Indigenous peoples, including the Attawandurin people and the Mississauga of the Credit. And we recognize and honor our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors. Next, I'd also like to acknowledge that the University of Guelph and OMAFRA have worked together for decades to support Ontario's agri-food and rural sectors and continue to do so with the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance, a collaboration between OMAFRA and the University of Guelph. This collaboration supports the people, places, and programs producing Ontario agri-food solutions with global impact. Now, as I said, we're here to talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on rural communities. So to start, an opening question. COVID-19 is no doubt a major disruption for rural communities, but rural communities are already dealing with a variety of challenges, some of which will no doubt be exacerbated by COVID-19 and others that really increase communities' vulnerability. So to start, maybe I'll have some of the panelists tell us something about your area and the impacts and, and challenges that you're seeing or hearing unfold. And I'd like to start with Jackie. Hi. Uh, so I'm Jackie and I work in a field office of OMAFRA and so I work out of the Clinton office. Um, I'm really fortunate to work, uh, to live where I work and to work where I grew up, uh, as well as working with rural communities and organizations in my job. And in my personal life, I volunteer also as a team leader and crisis responder with Victim Services of Huron County. I can speak about victim services here on only. Um, other counties have similar organizations, but they operate on different models. Um, in both roles, I'm seeing the stress in farmers and their families caused by disruptions to supply chains or even the threat of disruptions to supply chains. I see market uncertainty and they've worked really hard to raise their crops or their livestock and they're, they're not really sure what's gonna happen with their markets. I see small businesses in my town and, and restaurants in my town, um, in these small towns that were already struggling and they're trying to adapt really quickly to new consumer environments and restrictions. Uh, while my kids have had sufficient internet access to finish their schoolwork, some of their friends don't. Uh, some of my OMAFRA colleagues have encountered similar challenges in using new technology uh, that's been provided. You can see stress in people's social media posts, in the news feeds. Um, when you talk to people, you can hear it in their voices and that's going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, in rural Ontario, challenge is always proximity and privacy. Um, so in victim services, many of us are from here and we grew up here and it's always really difficult to respond to calls that end up being someone we know or someone that we're associated with either at work or through our other affiliations. Um, in some ways, uh, the ad adaptation to telecounseling uh, might be beneficial because um, transportation and availability of services is always a challenge for rural Ontario and just making it accessible for people when they need it. Um, perhaps this is an opportunity for us to provide those services. And I'm hopeful that um, working from home or telework, uh, we can prove that we can use these skills that we've learned uh, to attract professional jobs to rural Ontario. And life in Ontario sh shouldn't, in rural Ontario, shouldn't be seen as a barrier to advancing your career. Super, Jackie, thank you for that. Uh, Abdul, how about next to you? 
Okay, thank you very much for actually inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'm really happy to contribute my thoughts to this uh, unprecedented times in our, in our lives. Uh, so, uh, as we mentioned earlier, I'm a PhD student candidate at the Department of Geography, Environment and Geomatics. A part of my, the work I do is actually trying to, trying to build the capacity of rural communities, mostly through my interest in food and agricultural development. So I mostly ask questions uh, around building the capacity of agriculture through labor development and uh, technological advancement in uh, agriculture. Since the start of the COVID-19, uh, I have seen mostly two main issues that are intersect with the work, work I do that are unfolding in our rural communities. Uh, as we all know, we, we've had a lot of issues around labor, agricultural labor, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because we, did, we realized that the, the pandemic actually started at a time when uh, farmers were actually beginning to go into the fields, which meant that, as usual, the farmers will need their uh, temporary foreign workers who come in about 60,000 of them each year. So they, they did ask for exceptions. The one interesting thing about it is the fact that even going beyond the temporary workers who come in, the Canadian agriculture sector still has labor shortages. Year in, year out, we've seen that uh, there's still more than about 16,000 labor, labor shortages. And this year, we've seen the numbers are still around 10,000 labor shortages in the sector. And this has implications for rural communities because for most part, most of these farming jobs are uh, in our rural areas. And we've seen that the virus has actually worsened the situation as people are reluctant to go out to work, which means that we may, we may compromise the food that we produce in our rural communities and in a larger extent change some of the dynamics in the rural communities. Another interesting thing uh, regarding this, which intersects with my work, is actually building on these labor shortages is the fact that we have seen that farmers are beginning to look for solutions. So farmers in both rural and urban areas. And one area that we have seen that farmers are actually moving towards is trying to use technologies to offset the labor shortages in our, our rural communities. And we do know that from the labor shortages to disruptions in our food chain, and the outbreak has actually put a strain on rural agri-food sector, like in our supply chains, especially for small scale farmers. And we are also seeing small scale farmers with the supply chain being disrupted, looking to internet platforms to actually connect with consumers so that they can sell their food. So which means that farmers are actually moving a little bit more towards technology in order to actually re let's say recover from this uh, pandemic. And we've seen a lot with CSAs like going online, we've seen a lot with uh, consumers connecting. So there's a silver lining to it. Because over years, we've seen the agricultural sector being disconnected with rural communities. And since the pandemic is actually bringing farmers back closer to their consumers through the mediated through technologies, there is a silver lining that we may see that the farming community may reconnect with consumers and more broadly may reconnect with uh, their rural communities as well. So, Mm, that's... Yeah, we really wait to see what the dynamics will be. But these are some of the things that are actually unfolding in some of our rural community and agricultural sector. That's really interesting, Abdul. Um, Ryan, let's let's uh, talk to you for a minute. Yeah, it's great to be to be here and be able to join for this really important conversation. There's maybe two elements that I'd like to share that are impacting rural communities that I'm working with. One is around volunteerism. Uh, and Jackie mentioned that right off the hop around those organizations that are providing those frontline services. And throughout rural communities across this country, volunteerism has been a really key feature and it's part of the fabric of what makes rural a rural community. And rural communities over the past years have seen all sorts of um, kind of ebbs and flows and challenges and opportunities. Um, but at the moment, um, rural communities are, are challenged in how they respond um, during the COVID-19 crisis. We have seen all sorts of um, challenges related to the isolation that sometimes comes. Um, during COVID-19, the ability for individuals to volunteer their time, whether that's to assist with a Meals on Wheels program or young um, activities for young people, or whether that is with the community library or other um, public spaces. This has all been compromised under the COVID-19 measures. 
We also have a number of nonprofit organizations that have had to rethink how they do service delivery and how they build on their commitment to the people that live in their communities. And this is still unrolling. We're still figuring out how this all is going to take place, um, but it's really exciting to see some of the innovation that has emerged from our rural leaders and rural communities around this front. The second piece I maybe mentioned, Phil, is around newcomers. And Abdul mentioned the seasonal agricultural workers that may be involved in agricultural production in, in rural areas. Um, but rural communities continue to attract and to welcome newcomers, whether that's new immigrants, refugees, or maybe it's urban residents that are moving out of the city and into our rural communities. And over the past couple of months, these are really difficult time for newcomers that are moving into smaller communities. This pandemic has caused a disruption in terms of the supports for newcomers. It's challenged just the ability to tap into that social fabric, to be able to participate and to volunteer, um, to have your children engaged in, in extracurricular activities. And this is causing that, enhancing that sense of isolation that's taking place uh, within rural communities. And these are two of the kind of key things that I've been working on over the past uh, few months uh, with rural communities across the country around newcomers and, and volunteerism. Super, thank you, Ryan. And Helen. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Helen Handley Odame, and my area of role research is primarily in the area of connectivity, internet connectivity, and, and broadband services into rural areas and, and regions. And during the COVID 19 um, crisis, we can see how essential uh, broadband has become for every single Canadian, urban and rural. And yet we have to acknowledge that uh, even what we're doing here today, which is speaking on video conference with a, a number of different speakers, um, would actually be quite impossible in many rural areas across the country. And we have a digital divide uh, coming into this pandemic. It has um, made um, some of the crisis uh, more uh, difficult in terms of adapting livelihoods uh, as we all stay home. And for some rural users uh, lacking connectivity, uh, basically ex experiencing uh, even greater isolation from the rest of society and the economy. And we also can see during this uh, COVID-19 crisis very clearly that the internet and broadband is the way forward. So it's also the way to overcome uh, the disruption uh, that we've experienced uh, overcome the obstacles of this disruption um, that uh, we see with the pandemic and um, embrace uh, some of the opportunities that come along with improved connectivity. Literally overnight, Canadians had to stay at home. Companies had to go online. Uh, people lost their jobs or were laid off, had to go online, file for benefits. Um, kids were at home, had to start learning online. Telehealth services for those not infected with COVID-19 had to go online, including mental health services. We can see how essential connectivity is um, in this pandemic, and we have to make it a priority to come out of it. Thank you for that, um, Helen. And, and that's actually a really great segue um, that you raised this, this sort of flip side that internet is simultaneously a a challenge, a resource challenge, but it's also a solution. And uh, I'd like to dig into that question of the resources, um, whatever resources means to you in your particular area, uh, the resources that, that folks in rural communities have or need to have in order to uh, effectively respond and, and move sort of forward out of this pandemic. And, and Ryan, maybe I'll, I'll start with you because you also mentioned in, in your response innovation, and I think there's a relationship there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's maybe useful to take one step back and just to think for a second that there are over 6 million Canadians that live in a rural community from coast to coast to coast. And, and here, just in the province of Ontario, rural is home to about 1.4 million residents, uh, which would be about the fifth largest province if rural Ontario was a province unto itself in this country. And when we look at all of those rural communities and the people that make up those communities, uh, we have to be careful that we don't assume that all of our rural areas are equal, that they're not a homogenous region. We have different experiences, different capacities, and different resources that are available to each of those communities, whether you're in Tumblr Ridge in northern British Columbia or Blanc Sablon, Quebec, or here in Jarvis, Ontario. So we need to start thinking about 
um, why the COVID, our responses to COVID-19 need to look different in different places. And I think we have a tremendous amount of uncertainty and change that are taking place. And we need to differentiate that sometimes from the policies and the um, strategies that our urban counterparts might be utilizing um, and recognizing that they may or may not be the most appropriate for rural communities as we move forward. Rural communities tend to be smaller in size. They tend to have larger distances to other centers. And we also see that um, our, over years of um, regionalization efforts, a lot of services have moved out of our smaller communities. And this compromises our ability to access things from time to time. But at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of assets, skills, and resources that are contained within the people that live in rural communities. And I think COVID-19 is a really interesting opportunity to start thinking about those innovative strategies. We've got um, really cool initiatives that are linking local food producers to consumers in new ways that we've not done in the past. We see rural residents building activities and strategies around um, enhancing social development, um, providing opportunities for young people to continue to learn in a new way um, that often embraces the internet connectivities when those communities have it. And so at the end of the day, for me, I think one of the really important things that we have to think about as we move forward is around how to build place-based strategies. How do we build on the assets that are currently within our communities, within the people that live there? And how do we use those assets to meet what are local priorities, what people want to achieve? And I think during this pandemic, we've started to change our notion of what is a priority and, and where we rank some of our priorities. And I think this is an exciting topic now um, that we're just starting to embrace and starting to figure out how to move forward with. Uh, and I suspect my colleagues will have some commentary on that as well. Mm -hmm, super. And and yeah, you know, you there's there's different problems and therefore different solutions in different places. And and it it has me wondering, uh, you know, underneath a lot of what you guys were already talking about is rural broadband. Um, and I wonder, Alan, um, is in you know normally I would be the first person to say there is no one size fits all solution to any problem. But is to some extent perhaps improving and equalizing rural connectivity. Is that a start? Is that a one size fits all? Um, obviously acknowledging that the challenges are different even for that from place to place. Uh, to some extent, I'd agree, Phil, that it is um, a ubiquitous strategy. It's needed everywhere. It's, it's uh, uh, not just a basic service objective here in Canada for all Canadians. So it's a, the statement is not just for those who live in urban areas, <laughs> it's for all Canadians. Um, but the strategies of how to get there and what's actually built and how it's going to be used are going to be very regionalized. And that's also um, going to create an economy of, of scope and scale in a rural area that makes that kind of investment in broadband infrastructure affordable for both uh, uh, private sector and public sector uh, investors. So the strategies are going to be um, grassroots and uh, tailor-made for, for the local context, ideally, but not necessarily on a, on a single community level, that that could be very expensive. So uh, collaboration as a region tends to be the way that, um, that uh, broadband networks and next generation connectivity is, is being developed. Um, it's also very important to make efficient uses of resources in this area. Uh, while lane fiber cable is infinitely less expensive than building a highway or a bridge, uh, it's still quite expensive and um, we have to use resources wisely. Even at the um, coastal level, our data shows how crucial connectivity is to saving Canadians money in rural areas as well as in urban areas. Surprisingly, there's about 60% of households in rural areas who run a home-based business business that could be very micro to being a small or medium-sized business from home, from, far, from the farm or from the residence. And these types of uh, economic uh, activities are, are quite crucial for the livelihood of rural people and they're often not recognized. We don't collect data about them necessarily very well, we don't understand their needs, uh, and uh, we don't necessarily appreciate how seasonal uh, some of these home-based businesses are as well. So let's, let's look at the future going forward as one of opportunity through improved connectivity and getting um, services online for those who are isolated because they're on the wrong side of the digital gap. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Jackie, you know, 
we, we talk a lot during all of this about isolation and, and, and you know, and recognizing that even Zoom only things like Zoom can only do so much in terms of addressing isolation and that isolation, uh, whether it's from resources, whether it's from services, whether it's from uh, each other. Do you have any thoughts on on what it will really take to, to sort of solve some of these? What resources are needed to solve some of these challenges? Um, I'd like to touch on some things that Ryan uh, pointed out as well. Um, so Victim Services has a staff of three and we have about 50 volunteers um, that normally respond in person to provide our short term support. Um, we cover our volunteers cover 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and that takes a huge volunteer base. Um, when our volunteer base is you know, undergoing stress at the scale that COVID is, um, is pushing on our communities that really starts to destabilize our establishments. And so it's really careful. It's really important for us to recognize um, the signs of stress within our own volunteer base and our staff as well. Um, we haven't sent out volunteers since the first COVID travel restrictions were put in place. And, but that increased the burden on staff that we're normally uh, trying to do their own jobs, trying to manage their own families at home. And then they're, they're doing um, also the roles that the volunteers used to play. Um, we've since hired a few temporary staff uh, to manage crisis lines and to respond to some of the calls. Um, but we've also had to narrow the scope of the calls that we normally respond to. So we're really focusing on incidents involving domestic violence and fatalities. And those are the ones that are um, have the most potential to um, cause a ripple effect in our communities. Uh, we're trying to follow the recommendations for PPE as best we can, um, but at the same time we're trying to keep ourselves healthy, our families healthy, um, and watch for signs of trauma within our own volunteers. Um, one thing I'd like to point out with this move to online, it's really hard to reach out for help uh, when you're stuck in your home in the same conditions that are causing the crisis. So if there's a, a challenge with addiction or domestic violence or mental health, um, people are not only isolated by distance in rural Ontario, but they're isolated because of the travel restrictions. And people are working at home, they're doing school at home, and the levels of stress are just um, going up. Um, also, there haven't been shelters or housing available for those at risk of domestic violence, uh, unless the, it's a very severe case. So. Again, people don't have access to the services and uh, that can be a real challenge in, in rural Ontario at the best of times and it's just sort of been made worse. Um, we are anticipating that there'll be an increase in calls related to domestic violence, mental health crisis, um, suicide um, and addiction. Um, as time goes on, we've seen it with other um, tragic circumstances in our community, such as the tornado in Godrich. Um, so we've been ramping up our services. We'll be trying to um, attract more volunteers to help uh, when that's needed, um, but everybody will be. Um, other community mental health and addiction services have ramped up telecounseling as well um, as an attempt to sort of mitigate the potential impacts of the crisis. Uh, there are organizations that are, um, as Ryan said, really restructuring and trying hard to reach everyone in rural Ontario. So I'll just name a couple. There's West for Youth, which is an organization in Walkerton that provides online counseling for youth in rural Ontario. Um, community Mental Health Services and Choices for Change, um, that organization deals with addiction services. They're offering online counseling and group therapy for families. Uh, Do More Ag Foundation specifically appeals to farmers dealing with mental health issues and their families. Um, In the Know is a mental health program developed for farmers by Dr. Andrea Jones-Bitten at the University of Guelph. And there's also the Mental Health First Aid course offered by CMHA. But rural isolation is and always will be a challenge. So while the internet telecounseling offers some opportunities, there's also some real barriers. Thank you for that, and thank you for noting those resources. And I just wanted to to mention too that Dr. Andrea Jones Bitten was initially going to join us, but wasn't able to. But we will be sure at the end of this webinar to put up those resources for people. Um, Abdul, it it has me thinking that 
you know, being a newcomer to Canada, rural Canada is a, is a could be a challenging social environment in a normal year. And, and, and of course now, you know, everything we're hearing and uh, that we're talking about now, it, it's, it's a, it's an even more, uh, I don't want to say extreme, but challenging environment. And Ryan mentioned services for newcomers. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, on the, the newcomers that, that are coming to Canada, you, um, you know, the challenges they're facing, uh, you mentioned technology, if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah, so again, th thank you for, for the question. Uh, being a newcomer myself, and I, I would say, uh, having gone through a bit of experience all the way from Newfoundland to Ontario here, I've seen a fair bit of like what it takes for newcomers to settle in, uh, in, in rural Canada. And back in Newfoundland, I did a bit of work that looked at like newcomers, trying to attract newcomers into agricultural sector in rural communities. I'll just speak to some of that work uh, to, to, to just to build on it. And some of the things that we actually found, like for most newcomers, uh, like myself, has always been finding a community within a community. So if you are a newcomer that is going into a remote uh, area, somewhere like in rural Newfoundland or like rural Ontario, that you don't find people that you can easily relate to, it becomes hard to settle in. So we, we, we've seen calls where we, people would want to like say, come in with their families because that provides them the support network they need in order to settle in within the place. But just moving into a new area by just being like an individual by yourself can sometimes be really challenging. And of course, we are in very challenging times, which would mean that the situation might be much more worse than like even pre-COVID-19 period. And another important uh, thing that I do know for newcomers has always been issues of food and that ties into culture, right? So people have the food they eat. Uh, even myself being here in Gulf, sometimes I do struggle to find food that uh, I easily relate to. And for certain times I do have to move to Toronto to buy food, like just to be able to still remain close to home in terms of the food I eat. So in terms of like rural communities, the ability of rural communities to more or less like diversify what the kind of food that is available out there that can, as, can actually be a very crucial factor in terms of, uh, in terms of attracting newcomers post COVID or like helping newcomers to actually settle in. So I, I do think that, but from my personal experience as well, I do know that new rural communities have inherent characteristics, like as Ryan mentioned earlier, there's a lot of features in rural communities that will be very vital in, in recovering from uh, COVID-19 and in terms of long-term sustainability and resilience of rural communities. Because we do know that even at the middle of this pandemic, we've seen a lot of calls in Ontario where the premier was kept on like emphasizing that people should not go to their cottages, people should not move to their rural areas. So it, makes, it, it gets us thinking what is inherent in those rural communities that people actually want to go there. First of all, we might, people might just think about just the scenery and the fact that people go there to relax. But it, it, there's more to rural communities because as people are beginning to quote unquote flee from the uh, densities in, in urban areas post COVID, as people become more uh, skeptical, more afraid of like densities, we may see a surge in people trying to either settle in uh, a rural community, be it new newcomers or be it just Canadians who actually will want to go to rural communities to in order to settle in. Mm -hmm. uh, so that those inherent characteristics by the low densities in rural communities could actually be a very important factor in actually getting more people into rural communities or like in the ability of I rural see. communities to actually recover from this as well. And mm -hmm. it, so in most times it can also be like uh, an appeal to newcomers as well mm -hmm. because uh, if, if you come from a rural area in somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, like myself, mm -hmm. like if you are coming into an area, sometimes you might find it very hard settling into a large community. Like personally coming into Canada and like entering through Cornerbrook uh, in Newfoundland, it was a very important phase in my life because going into a much more smaller community was very instrumental in the way I was able to transition into Canada, right? So it, it plays a lot into how like, we try to put in place institutions post COVID that will be able to attract newcomers and try to make more rural communities more attractive. Thank you for that. And and you you mentioned and you it's really offered a fantastic segue. 
um, to our third sort of planned question. You mentioned recovery and you mentioned resilience, and 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 we really want to do sort of have their a forward looking um, component of this conversation. And 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 so maybe um, Helen, if could I ask you to 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 comment a little bit on the future and and re resilience sort of in the short term, and but then what? Sure. Um, so we have to have an exit strategy for the pandemic and our exit strategy, in, in my opinion, has to ensure um, that the way forward is one based on a caring economy. And I, I mean that very intentionally. We have learned through this crisis about the importance of caring, caring for one another, caring for our environment, uh, caring um, for our country as, as Canadians. And, and caring for newcomers and caring for those who are not well, who um, uh, are uh, struggling, who are jobless. So the exit strategy has to be based on, on in my opinion, on a caring economy. This caring economy um, going forward will have a deep connectivity because these are the connections. These are the things that connect one of us um, as individuals, as families, as, as communities and societies across this big country. So connectivity is absolutely essential, should be priority number one or within the top three, in my opinion, because that infrastructure underlies all of the new social practices that we will have to develop going forward and our capacity uh, for adapting uh, to this uh, new, new context, but also all the services, all the economic opportunities that improved connectivity can bring about so we need to be very creative and very industrious, hardworking to make this happen. And what I'm really pleased about is that while attention to rural broadband has sort of gone up and down over time, it has really climbed. The awareness of this has really climbed in the last few months. And every Canadian is now beginning to recognize that we're paying a big cost because we're not connected within this country. We also need science. So maybe I'm a, a scientist, I'm a researcher, but I do believe that the evidence and the, the data, the research um, initiatives that we need to evolve are very important. I'm so pleased that communities are, are contacting, reaching out to us at the University of Guelph saying, you know, we have some data, we have some material here. Could you have a look at it? Could you engage with us? So communities engaging with researchers and scientists will also be an important part of our exit strategy. Thank you for that. Jackie, Abdul Rahim shared with us um, his experiences as a newcomer, and he mentioned communities within a community. And I wonder, um, I, I wanted to get your take on resilience as well and looking forward and what we could really do to, to, to foster that for people coping with, with these challenges. Yeah, so um, it is a community within a community. Even though I've grown up in this area, I'd moved to a different village and and it was, even for myself, it was, you know, learning new people, learning to meet new people and new traditions and new ways of doing things. So I can only imagine, um, you know, how, how, how difficult it is for newcomers, but also there's a responsibility on us to be welcoming and to try and reach out to people and make them feel comfortable. Um, I think this COVID stuff has, um, it has created an environment where we are reaching out a little bit more. The community drive-bys for birthdays and anniversaries. Um, the little, um, our village did craft, village-wide craft things for people to get engaged um, on a common level through, the, through this COVID um, experience. And those things wouldn't have happened if we weren't made to. So there's a positive in that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that now that we've gotten to know our more local community because we've been stuck here, I'm hoping that that community will, um, will continue and will continue to foster those things rather than foster the, the community that we were doing perhaps over the computer and over social media rather than the people immediately around us. Um, if people aren't comfortable doing in-person counseling, I'm hoping that this growth in the telecounseling um, and telehealth will help them. Um, 
it, it may not be perfect, but it might be an opportunity for people that otherwise wouldn't have been able to attend or wouldn't otherwise get the treatment or help that they actually need. Um, think services like physiotherapy. I, I don't think that was probably very common um, in terms of doing it over Zoom, but we're doing it. And you know what, maybe people are getting some of that preventative health care that they wouldn't have otherwise. So how can we make that better for rural Ontario where access to medical services is at a premium? Um, I'm, um, I, I'm, someone always wins and somebody always loses and that's unfortunate. Um, so while it's a disadvantage for commercial real estate, I'm really hopeful that new workplaces will see that you know, their employees can work remotely. And I'm really hoping that some of those employees choose to work remotely from rural Ontario. And that gets those, those that economic driver simply by having people live where they work and, and having them shop locally rather than stopping at the store in the city on their way home, on their commute on the way home. And I think another positive we haven't really touched on is people building gardens and learning to grow vegetables. Um, there's been a real increase in that. You see it on social media posts where building, people are building raised gardens and talking about planting um, more plants around their properties. Even if they don't continue to do that after the travel restrictions are lifted and they can freely go to grocery stores and stuff, maybe that's the awareness and education that we never would have got through any sort of government campaign. So I'm kind of hoping that, you know, people will enjoy um, growing their own vegetables, even on a small scale, and that they'll appreciate the farmers and commercial um, agriculture and farmers markets a little bit more when they return to shopping normally. So I see some, some wins and some, and, and some losses, but I think there, there's some positives if we see them. Super, thank you. And, and we're getting some questions, but before we turn to them, I just wanted to ask Ryan, you actually wrote or edited a book on rural resilience. Do you have any sort of closing thoughts on the matter of resilience before we turn to uh, Q&A? Yeah, there were three things that kind of came up in my mind um, that we've kind of talked about a little bit, um, so I won't chat about them in too much length, but I think one is this exciting part around re-examining our priorities around what we want to see in our communities uh, as we move forward. Um, we've got priorities to kind of survive the current COVID-19 measures, but we also have priorities for thriving in a post-COVID-19 reality. And at the moment, I use often the language of people-centered economies, which I think is, Helen and I are talking the same things, but maybe different language, um, but it's very much focused on people as opposed to profit or other motivations that have often guided the economy. And in part of doing that, I think what we really need to ensure is that rural voices are heard. They're heard by local governments, they're heard by provincial and federal governments, um, because these are the people that are on the front lines, they're on the main streets, they understand the dynamics, they know their neighbours, um, that, that can provide a kind of a, a solid roadmap for how to move forward in all of this. I think there's also a really strong opportunity to mobilise that boots on the ground um, philosophy where we can strengthen the role and the importance of voluntary and nonprofit and, and charitable organizations, but also entities that bridge our community, whether that's a chamber of commerce, whether that's a regional collaboration initiative. There's an opportunity um, to really ensure that uh, we start working together. And it reminds me of good old Red Green who said, we're, we're all in this together. Which brings me to the third part that I think is really critical as we move forward, which is sharing opportunities that have both worked and have not worked. So as communities are trying their community craft initiatives or as they're thinking about new strategies for broadband or how to welcome newcomers, we need to make sure that we're sharing these stories. We need to share them through um, social media, through our community newspapers and radio stations, through organizations like the Federations of Agriculture and Municipal Associations, perhaps even groups like the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. But we need to share what's working but we also need to share what didn't work. And it's not because we, we want to announce the failures of what maybe didn't materialize, but rather this helps other communities start to think about how they might adapt some of these strategies and these initiatives to their own conditions and to their own community, which allows us to collectively learn from each other. Thank you for that, Ryan. Now, now I have a couple of uh, audience questions here that, that I'll 
I'll pass along. And and one of these is is pretty practical. I think it's probably going to go first to Helen. And that's who is whose responsibility is it to ensure that farmers have access to broadband or five G? Um, would it be government gov governmental lobbying or NGOs or or um, industry groups? What? Uh, how do you see that sort of the, the social license? So it's everyone's responsibility. That's the quick answer. Um, but um, let's remember broadband services are privately owned. They're, they're owned by large telecommunication companies as well as small telecommunication companies that are located locally in Canada. So uh, we are always talking about uh, public-private partnerships and the public sector engagement has to be very connected to the communities where the building of this type of infrastructure is involved so that there's always community engagement. That makes it everyone's responsibility. We also have the responsibility as taxpayers in Canada, all of us, to make sure that priorities are set so that we don't keep paying for old legacy technology, old technology that just gets sort of maintained and repaired in rural areas and barely improves uh, data throughput and, and um, security issues. So let's make sure that we have the um, best possible um, technology at the, the best possible prices when we make these investment decisions. So this is where the public and the private sector have to work very closely together in, in these efforts. And I just want to say that rural areas are used to working hard. People who live in rural areas who are farming, they're used to working hard. But I've often seen too that farmers and the agri-food industry doesn't play or doesn't team up with telecommunications very well. Why is that? In some of the most successful countries around the world, there's actually alliances between agri-food and telecoms. Why? Because these two industries know they need each other. So the more we can do to build this kind of alliance in Canada, I think it will definitely directly benefit farmers and the agri-food um, value chains that consumers benefit from. So that would be uh, that would be my two cents worth, Bill. Thank you for that. Now, um, let's. Um, I wonder, does anybody have uh, any sense or experience what one of those questions is about what rural communities may be doing um, since they're relying, uh, earlier it came up the, the matter of folks from urban communities, um, sort of whether it's flocking or fleeing or whatever it is to, to um, rural places. Um, the restrictions are sort of just soft restrictions saying don't do it. Um, are, does anybody have any, have any um, experience with what communities are or might be doing? Um, to protect themselves. I can maybe jump in with a, a quick response to that, Phil. I think one of the challenges is just having that communication between rural communities and their seasonal residents. Um, often seasonal residents in, in trying to move out to the rural countryside are not doing it to, to hinder rural communities. They're doing it because they, they're attracted to, to, the, to the landscape, to the atmosphere, to the environment that is created within our rural communities. And I think what's really necessary, and, and there's been a number of communities that are doing this well, is having that open dialogue with seasonal residents so that they truly understand why um, additional pressures might be placed on their, their seasonal community with their attendance at their cottage. And I think when we start to move it away from that kind of tension-filled us versus them dialogue, we start to see urban residents say, well, of course, yes, I don't wish to endanger the healthcare system of rural communities. I don't want to impact negatively the availability of food within the community. Um, they see themselves and they're empowered to see themselves as a contributor to the future of that rural area. And I think that's really quite critical in this dialogue. Any other comments on that? Yeah, the, the other thing I would add is that when these, um, the people come to rural Ontario, they're not necessarily familiar with the organizations and the services that are offered there. Um, even the people that live here aren't to some degree and we try our best through marketing and advertising and social media to let people know, but it's a real challenge for some of the organizations to help people who might come here that aren't normally from here. Um, and those people are in crisis and we need to find a way to communicate and connect with them through other organizations. So with uh, to leave this on something of a positive note, I, 
I'm curious what you all have to think or, or have to say. Um, we know that there's a number of challenges that people in rural communities are facing, but we all also know that rural places can be amazing and, and really great sort of centers of innovation and caring and, and resilience. And so I wonder, um, what lessons do you think rural communities going through this can offer to urban and suburban communities in terms of surviving through the lockdown and then emerging uh, perhaps stronger and more resilient than before? Uh, just to uh, comment on that, I, speaking from uh, the perspective of the work I do, I, we do know that for most rural communities, like over a long period of time, we've seen that there's, like I mentioned earlier, there's a disconnection between the farming and uh, the community. But more importantly, we do know that rural communities are, for most parts, also have uh, some kind of connection with agriculture, with their food. Like we've seen a lot of connection between people, like consumers, rural, rural areas, and the farming industry. And if there's anything that COVID-19 has taught us, from my perspective, has been the value of food and the value of actually appreciating where our food comes from. So, and this is something that has been very inherent in our rural communities and rural life. And I think that for urban areas going forward, I think that is something that urban areas can actually learn to actually appreciate food, to actually connect with the source of their food in order to actually make sure that going forward, we don't, we, we do not hope for something of this sort, but, but once we create that connection between uh, consumers in urban areas and the food source as well, it will be very critical in the way we recover from this. Super. Other thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to share something that uh, I've seen from, from the rural areas that's very encouraging. A lot of the communities in rural areas, when, when they lost the place that they can uh, go in and, and, and shop or um, maybe their church, um, and uh, other sort of social spaces and they became a little bit more isolated because they as well were on, on lockdown. One of the things that they built were, were networks of communication and, um, and assistance. So uh, uh, taking uh, food out to people who were housebound, who, who couldn't get out to shop, um, sort of uh, also uh, creating uh, chat groups through just basic telephone contact contacts with one another, keeping tabs on each other, making sure that um, someone needed a hand on the farm, they could come over and, and help out. And, and these, are, these are examples of, of rural areas, um, self-reliance and, and that collective um, spirit that are, have always been there. But during the pandemic, I think those types of actions have become essential for all of us in our lives. Maybe we've We've become uh, too individually oriented, certainly too, um, too much oriented to just the stress of everyday life and the ability to just be outside and, and take a breath of fresh air and, and look at something growing. We're not going to take that for granted anymore, I don't think. So let's, let's always remind ourselves what happened when that was taken away and let's make sure that that never happens to us going forward and especially to young people. Uh, in Canada. They, children and young people deserve everything we can do to make um, the situation coming out of this pandemic a healthy one and a secure one, safe one. Well, I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding, and I think that's a really fantastic sentiment to end this webinar on. Uh, Helen, Abdul-Rahim, Jackie, and Ryan, thank you all very much. Uh, it's been fantastic to have this conversation with all of you.